Good morning, class. This is the lecture for scheduled for um, April the 6th on the military in Turkey and the it's it sees itself its role as the guardian of what is in Turkish is called uh, Kemalism. That is the ideology of the founder of Turkey, Turkish Republic, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. So uh, Turkey, um, as I mentioned in the earlier before the midterm break, Turkey is the probably the luckiest country in the Middle East that doesn't have any oil. Um, but it came out of the war, World War I, with a coherent government. Um, so unlike Iran, which had to build a government around the Shah, or the Arab countries, which were under British or uh, French, uh, either direct or indirect rule. French, rule. French rule was direct, English rule was indirect. That is, the English preferred to allow monarchs who were sympathetic to the British, but they pulled the strings from behind. So that you don't have a really truly a national governments being formed in the Arab countries uh, during the interwar period, the period between World War I and World War II. Turkey, you did. Uh, Turkey, as we'll see when we talk, uh, I give the lecture next week, I'm uh, sorry, the next lecture, which is on oil and water, Turkey has very little oil, but it does have abundant amount of water. As I think I mentioned at the beginning of the class, it is the only country uh, outside, yeah, well, it is the only country in the Middle East that can, has both sufficient water and sufficient food resources to feed its population. And that, of course, will be much more important in the 21st century as it goes on and global warming and all these other kinds of things that are, are problems. So Turkey uh, has that advantage. It has advantage then also of, of having a period when under Ataturk, they closed themselves off from the major economic um, developments in the world by relying on self-reliance. That is, if they import substitution, that you do not import anything that you can make yourself. And so Turks went without for a, a lot of the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. But by going without, they laid the foundation for a, their own industrialization and their own reliance on their, on their own initiative, both in the banking industry and various other kinds of, of uh, service industries. So they eventually would come out on top because of that austerity. So let's go back. Remember, uh, Mustafa Kemal initially had said that there would be political parties, but by the time of Sheikh Said's revolt uh, in 1925, he became increasingly pessimistic about Turkey's ability to have a multi-party democracy because he wanted it to follow what he wanted it to do. And uh, multi-party democracy kind of got in the way of that. And so all parties were banned, although he made it clear that eventually Turkey would be a um, uh, fully functioning democracy. Now, this, this goes along with what is the view of, of Kemalism, I think. One of the key elements of it is that, it, it, remember, it is born at the same time as, roughly the same time as communism in the Soviet Union. And so the Kemalist elite uh, in the army and in the government uh, viewed that they knew best for the people in the same way that the Communist Party in the Soviet Union felt that it knew what was best for the people. And that the people, if left unbridled, would be rebellious and anarchic and there would be no order in the country. So the main role of the army uh, was to support the civilian government, and this is a key difference between Turkey and um, the Arab countries, is that uh, the, after Ataturk, um, well, and his successors, Inunu, but after the two founders, you might say the co-founders of the Republic, uh, the uh, army doesn't intervene. So the, the political parties are, are civilian, and the army only comes in when it feels that it's necessary. Um, as I said, they see themselves as guardians. So I want to trace that. There's going to be a lot of names I'm in parties, because unlike the Arab world, there are numerous political parties in Turkey. Uh, I'm kind of sketch them out for you on the study guide. Um, and also I want to w tell you that the, the parties usually go by their, uh, either their English names or their Turkish names, or sometimes a combination. 
So those are all laid out for you. Some of them go by there uh, when political scientists or historians are writing about them. They, um, they use the initials, the Turkish initials. So I have laid that all out for you and I kind of lie, one party morphs into several different other parties and kind of lay that out for you on the study guide. So don't be, when you're listening to this, don't be overpowered by the kind of alphabet soup of Turkish political um, parties. Uh, they're on the sheet. Uh, you won't be tested on them, but you do need to keep in mind that there are two main trends, and that's what we'll start off with. So the main party is the Democratic People's Party. I'm sorry, not Democrat. Republican People's Party. Uh, that's the party that is founded by uh, Mustafa Kemal and then sees itself as the the ideology, ideology of Kemalism. So that is the, the key elements to that are, I mentioned them before, but just to remind you, is laicism. And by what the Turks mean laicism, they don't mean secularism so much the way Americans do, but rather more like the French meaning of laicite. That is the complete separation of church and state. The, the state has no connection whatever to the church, or in this case, the mosque. Uh, so that's one. Nationalism, very intense nationalism. So you, you get a party that is on the left in Turkey economically, but is just as hawkish uh, toward nationalism as the right. So that's a kind of an unusual leftist party in, in the world scene. Uh, and then also then because it is on the left, it's strong for um, workers' rights, uh, women's rights, and also for the control of st industry by the state. Remember, Turkey decided not to take control of the land the way that uh, Soviet Union did. So in Turkey, the really the, in the, the Ataturk period, the only private um, industry you could talk about would be agriculture industry. All the manufacturing and the production of metals, coal, uh, that all is, which, which Turkey is quite rich in both um, mining, both the minerals and of, also of coal. Uh, that was all in the hands of the government, as was most manufacturing. So, for example, all alcoholic products were produced by state factories. Um, much of the, the canning industry, the food production industry, was also owned by the state. So, in that sense, the 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 Republican People's Party uh, is socialist. So it's a mixture of nationalist and socialist. That's the party of, of Kemalism. And so it sees itself as the ideology of the founding father. It still is in the, it has survived. It goes out of business for a while in the 90s when it's banned. But it, is, it has been consistently the one party that has survived throughout the, um, the 20, 9, 20th and 20, into the 21st century, although it's a, it gets now about 30% of the vote. So I will sometimes call that the JHP. That is the Turkish um, pronunciation of the letters. So the name in English is uh, Republic and People's Party. Republic is Cumhuriyet in Turkish, so it starts with a J, C, which is pronounced like a J in Turkish. And then um, Hey, it stands for Hulk Peoples, and then Parti, Parti C in Turkish, Party. So JHP, I'll be calling it JHP. Um, every once in a while, if I catch myself, I'll say JHP Republican Peoples. But I may just say JHP. That's what every Turk, uh, Turkish scholar calls them, and even most scholars writing in English uh, about Turkey call them the JHP. It's just easier than saying the Republican People's Party. So JHP. So JHP is the 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 party of of uh, Ataturk, and um, it. Uh, but when Ataturk dies and the um, presidency passes to uh, Inunu, who's on your list, Ismet Inunu, uh, he makes the promise that there will be free elections in Turkey after the war, because this is he comes to power at the time World War II is breaking out in Europe. And so, in fact, in 1946, the um, Turkish government allows for the creation of an opposition party, which interestingly for us in America calls itself the Democrat Party. So it's in, in Turkish, Democrat Party, see? And I'll just call it the Democrat Party because it's the name is almost the same in English as it is in Turkish. Now, what's interesting for Americans then is you have, you could say there's a Republican Party and there's a Democrat Party. 
but they're the opposite in Turkey in what they, their ideology. So the Republican People's Party, CHP, was very strong on government control of business. It was very strong on um, secularism, the absence of Islam in the state, uh, and it was strong in labor rights, uh, women's rights, and state control of industry. So the Democrat Party, which, uh, as I said, first emerges in 1946, is based, remember I told you the landlords, landowners were allowed to keep their land. It's based in the, in the more rural areas of Turkey, smaller towns, provincial towns, places where agriculture is really important. And it, it draws on that class of people. It also draws on people who are still, consider themselves actively Muslim and are kind of upset about this trend away from Islam in public life in Turkey. And they, they are then capitalists and pro-religion. So that sounds more like <laughs> our Republican Party in the United States. So many of you want to keep it uh, in mind that basically, and then all the other parties that come along are basically in that. There are be more extreme right-wing parties that I'll talk about in a minute, but basically then the division in Turkey is between uh, those people who want to uphold the Ataturk idea of uh, strong labor unions, uh, state control of some of the economy, if not all of the economy, uh, and uh, secularism. Those who oppose that then are those who are very in favor of capitalism. They're in favor of religion coming back into the place. They're in favor of, of lessening the rights of workers. Um, so they, you know, in a lot of ways, they look to be a kind of a mirror image of um, <clears throat> the Republican Party in the United States, although don't be confused because it's called the Democrat Party in Turkey. All right, so the Democrat Party then mounts a campaign in 96, uh, and then in, I'm sorry, 46, and then in 1950, they actually win the parliament, they take over the parliament. And their head of the party then is a man named Adnan Menderes, and it's all on your, your notes, so I won't stop and spell his name. And in this period, there is, uh, Turkey, remember, had joined NATO in 1949. Turkey had joined, um, I'm sorry, had sent troops uh, to the Korea conflict, the United Nations, on the United Nations umbrella. And uh, the United States then looked favorably upon Turkey. Remember, there was the Eisenhower Doctrine that said that the United States would come to the aid of Turkey because it was threatened by uh, Soviet expansion. Uh, and so, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Truman Doctrine, not Eisenhower. Sorry, that made that make my mistake. Truman Doctrine, but it, during the Eisenhower period, that's why I made that flip. During the Eisenhower period, then Turkey becomes a major recipient of uh, United States foreign aid. And the United States, in giving foreign aid, generally doesn't give money. It gives uh, the right to buy American products. In much of the developing world, that was American wheat and other, other American agricultural products. Uh, Egypt, India, for example, got huge, huge amounts of wheat um, and other food products from the United States under the foreign aid. But Turkey had was self-sufficient in food. So what did Turkey do? You have to buy American products. They give you the money and then you buy American products with it. And so it helps the United States economy as well as helping the country that the aid is going to. So Turkey bought lots of, a large amount of weapons. The Turkish army uh, was continuing to grow. Uh, every Turk, Turkish male has to serve two years in the army. So it had quite a large uh, standing army. And it, to, to this day, it has the second largest army in NATO. The United States is the largest. And then the second largest army in NATO is the Turkish army. Uh, it is not entirely, everyone is not drafted these days that are allowed to buy their way out, but it's still, everyone is supposed to serve, every male is supposed to serve two years. I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Um, but uh, because of the foreign aid, what did Turkey buy? Well, it bought tractors, it bought trucks, it bought concrete. And so Turkey started to transform itself, or the remember the private sector, the private sector is in agriculture, the agricultural sector starts to transform itself into uh, what we might call a capitalist agricultural system that uh, the people buy up the land from the peasants or in some cases where the peasants are uh, just sharecroppers, especially in the south of the country, southeast of the country, the peasants are just kicked off their land as the landlords buy tractors and mechanize their agriculture. 
the concrete is used to build highways, super highways, so the Turkey starts to look like the United States with divided highways uh, across it. And then uh, they don't go for trains. The trains had started under the, the Ottoman regime, but they, during the Republican period, they pretty much stopped using trains, although in the 21st century, they start, for ecological reasons, they've started to have more trains and fat, high speed trains. But in the, all throughout the, from 1950s on, it looked like the United States, super highways, super trucks, carrying the, 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 tran the produce of the countryside. Okay, well, what happens to those displaced peasants? And there are lots of displaced peasants. Uh, Turkey had been a predominantly agricultural country uh, with most of the people living on the land up until the 1950s. It switched so that by the 1960s, it was a predominantly urban country. Uh, the city of Ankara, the capital, went from maybe 100, 200,000 people in 1950. By 1970, it was 2 million. Istanbul, which had always had a large fairly large population because it was the capital of the Ottoman Empire. It went from around a million in 1950 up to um, uh, already by at least six million by 1970. So people are leaving the countryside and going to the cities. That's one place, one way to go. The other is that this, this transformation of the rural economy in the 1950s and 1960s takes place at a time when Western Europe having recovered from World War II, is going on full speed industrialization, production, and they need workers. They don't have enough workers to work in the factories. So both Germany and Holland, uh, the Netherlands, invite uh, Turkish workers to come and work. And that was meant to be a, a temporary thing in uh, German, they were called Gästarbeiter, so guest workers, they were expected to stay long. But we're talking over a million people uh, left Turkey, uh, mostly males, although eventually they would bring their wives back, They'd go back to Turkey, get married and bring their wives back to Germany. And that would then be the nucleus of what today is a very vibrant Turkish German community of well over 2 million people. So you had the Turks living in Europe. Uh, as I said, Holland was a lesser, smaller number. Uh, France did not take uh, Turks so much because they were relying on their foreign workers coming from the former French colonies of uh, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Uh, there were some Turks going to France as well, and some Turks also ended up in, in Britain, but the vast majority of them went to uh, Germany. Um, so they have a very large Turkish population in Germany, and then that sends wealth back and on um, Mercedes, you know, start to see Mercedes because Turkey had a very limited automobile production because remember the cars had to be made in, in uh, Turkey. And so they had uh, uh, rooms with Fiat in Italy to make a Turkish small compact car that was made in Turkey in the 50s and the 60s. But you started to see more and more Mercedes on the streets and these were Turkish workers who had bought a Mercedes in Germany and then driven it back to Turkey. They, were, they had to pay very high taxes by the Turkish government, but they were allowed to, to bring those cars in. They weren't allowed to sell them to somebody else, uh, but they could keep them and they could give them then to their children. So you see a lot of old Mercedes, especially hanging around uh, from the 60s and the 70s. Uh, so uh, the ones who went to Germany, uh, they tended to prosper. The ones who went to the cities, not so much. And what you have then is a growth of slums around the major cities and the three major cities of Turkey are Ankara, the capital, Istanbul, the old capital, and pretty much the commercial center, and also somewhat industrial center, and then Izmir, which is the port city on the Aegean, and then in the south, there's a fourth one that's called Adana, A-D-A-N-A, -A -A, Adana, uh, and that's a center of uh, commercial agriculture, cotton especially, and then textile industries would grow up there. So all around these, these, this is typical third world countries. So you start to have these uh, slums that are inhabited by rural people who move to cities. Now there's a difference because remember that uh, one of the principles of, of, uh, of, of the Republican People's Party, Jahit Pei, is a kind of a, a paternalistic socialism. And so Turkey had a law that said that if you put up your structure overnight on vacant land, even if that land was owned by somebody else, but if it was unoccupied, so in other words, it's say an empty field, you could put up a roof overnight and then you could then, that would, you could be there, you had tenancy, you didn't, you couldn't sell it, but 
you could that was your place. And so in Turkey, this law is called Gece Kondu, which is on your sheet. Gece means evening or night. Kondu means it was put up. So Gece Kondu means literally put up overnight. And that, you say, well, that, why does that make things better? Well, once they have basically tenancy, these peasants have tenancy, they can start to improve those, those uh, slums. So things that were, you know, tin shacks like you might see in countries like in African countries or Latin American countries or South Asia, they get transformed within 10 years to concrete block. And then once they're more permanent, the municipalities, again, because they're basically socialist in their ideology, they bring water in. Now, electricity is something else. And so in the 1970s and the 1980s, before the government started to bring in electricity, to, you would see these people had built jerry-rigged electric wires so that they would basically be stealing electricity from the main lines that would go out maybe a mile away from the, the Geji Kondu. So these Geji Kondus grew up all around and they're now they're permanent places. And the, the reforms of the 1990s, people got permanent uh, tenants, uh, possession of them. And there are Geji Kondus you go to today in, in Istanbul or Ankara and you would not know that they were once a slum. They are, you know, apartment buildings not the fanciest apartment buildings, but they're, they're, they're pretty solid. And so again, that shows that Turkey had that kind of, because of Kemalism, had that kind of paternalism uh, toward its peasants. Okay, so let's go back to our political situation. So the, the, uh, the under uh, Adnan Menderes, the Republican Party, I'm sorry, the Democratic Party, there, see, I keep slipping back and forth. The Democrat Party, uh, started to uh, lessen the restrictions on Islam. The first was the call to prayer was allowed again in Arabic. Uh, it had been allowed briefly after Ataturk died in Turkish, but under uh, the Democrat Party, it was allowed in Arabic. If so, five times a day, the call to prayer. Uh, the, the, some of the mosques that had been closed were reopened. The government took established a ministry of religion, which would pay the salaries of the uh, preachers in the mosques. So they became government employees. Uh, they allowed open the religious schools. That, so in other words, you could choose not to go to the government school, the secular school. You could choose to go send your children to religious schools, which were called Imam Hatep. It's on your your list is there that Imam is someone who is a, a, a religious figure. Hatip is someone who gives the, the sermon in, uh, on Friday. So these um, Imam Hatip schools are started in this period. They become much more dominant later on after the 90s, but they're allowed in. And not only that, in the secular schools, um, religion is made a topic and parents have to opt out. So in other words, if you don't opt out, if you don't send a letter to school saying you don't want religious education, your children then have an hour of Islam every day in their classrooms. So a lot of secular people are very angry about this. The economy also doesn't do all that great, uh, although it's, it's slowly because of this urban, these people coming in. And so in 1960, the army says the, uh, the government is, is corrupt and they stage a coup, they overthrow the government. And this is the first military intervention. Um, they announce that they are going to uh, return the country uh, to democracy, uh, which they do in, in 1961, having written a new constitution. And what the new constitution does is it sets up a, um, basically a guidance council um, that will be meet on a regular basis. So it will consist of the cabinet. So the civilian cabinet, the prime minister and the president, Turkey, the head of state is the president. He has very little power other than to call the parliament together and things like that. And then there's the prime minister whose party is the dominant party in the parliament. And then there are the other ministers. So the leading ministers, the foreign minister, the minister of agriculture, those guys, those would all see it in women because in Turkey there were women as well as men who were in the, in the government. Uh, the, those people would sit uh, in a room with the top 
military brass. So the head of the army, the head of the air force, the head of the navy, the head of the intelligence group, which is called MIT in Turkey, MIT, uh, military intelligence. Um, uh, so they would all meet. So the 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 army and the civilians are equally represented, and they're supposed to be the guys who hash out the the program for the country. I mean, it goes back to the parliament to be approved. But you do have this this kind of um, watchdogs, if you will, of the army, and that's embedded in the Constitution of 1961. Uh, then the political parties are allowed to again to operate, and the um, except for the Democrat Party, the Democrat Party is banned because um, the government says it was corrupt, and in fact Adnan Menderes is put on trial for being corrupt and is hung. Uh, the other members of the of the government at that time are imprisoned. And then the party morphs, it becomes known as the Justice Party, Adalet Party in, in Turkey. And it's always called Justice Party in English. And so I'll just call it the Justice Party. And the Justice Party is headed by, um, uh, blocking his name right now, I have, must have it written down here somewhere. Uh, I don't have it written down, oh no. It's a problem. Uh, see, even I get confused on the names. So I won't remember his name. I'll have it on their sheet. It's on the sheet, but I don't have it here on my notes in front of me. Uh, it, it is then, in fact, what had been the old uh, Democrat Party. So the Justice Party then is, is pro-Islamic. It, is, uh, it seeks to, you know, capitalism, encourage capitalism. Uh, and um, it, then you have the opposition of the... Uh, Republican People's Party, the JHP, and the Justice Party. All right, so this, the late 60s then, is a time of great deal of turbulence in Turkey, uh, as it was in Europe. Uh, Turkish middle class is growing. Large numbers of people are going to university. In Turkey, in university, you, you basically take an exam, and based on how well you did on the exam, you get a place in the university. The universities were run by the state, so they're free. There were two private universities that were founded by Americans. One was uh, what is called Robert College, it's on your list. It, in 1969, the people, the, uh, the trustees of Robert College gave it to the Turkish government uh, with certain conditions that the faculty and most of the faculty were foreigners, uh, English, because the university was taught in English. Uh, so there were English, Americans, various other foreigners. Uh, they would keep their jobs as long as they're until their retirement age. Uh, the university would continue to be taught in English. Uh, but other than that, it was taken over by the university, I'm sorry, by the state, and it changed its name to Boazici. And that's on your list, because that's a hard one. For the, the spelling doesn't look like how it's pronounced, unless you know how to pronounce Turkish letters. So Boazici. And when we sent students to Turkey, when um, exchange program, that's generally where they go. Uh, to, to in, it's in Istanbul, it's a lovely campus on, on, the, on the hill overlooking the Bosphorus. Uh, and that's, um, that was given to the Turkish government. The other um, main university that was started by Americans was in Ankara, started in the 1920s, and it was called Middle East Technical University. And it then is, um, it, as it sounds, uh, whereas Robert College was largely a liberal arts college mo modeled after liberal arts colleges in the United States. In fact, some people would say it looks like uh, Amherst in its architecture. Um, uh, METU, our Middle East Technical College, uh, it was uh, like an MIT. It was for science and technology. That was also taken over, and so the name then Middle East was just changed into Turkish Ortodo, but most people still just call it METU. So that's Middle East Technical University, the English, English uh, initials. Um, so universities are active, and there's a radicalization of the students. And then the, the, the Radicalization also comes because of the, the migration of Turkey's two minority groups um, to the cities from the countryside. Most of the, my, you know, the either religious, I'll give you the two names. There's a religious minority called Alevi, A-L-E-V-I on the list. This is an offshoot of Shia Islam. And it's a peasant religion and has no organized clergy. Um, the Sunnis don't consider them to be true Muslims. There's a lot of prejudice against them. So that, that's it. But they speak Turkish. So they are a religious minority, Alevi. 
and the others Kurds, and we've already mentioned Kurds. There's a, a sizable Kurdish population. We don't know for sure how many. Most people, Kurds claim 20%, but based on one, the census returns of 1953, which was the only time people in Turkey were asked what language they spoke, but also based on the voting for the Kurdish parties uh, in the 19, um, in the 1990s and 1920s, uh, 2000s, when the Kurdish parties, although not officially Kurdish, but unofficially Kurdish, uh, the voting is more like 10%. So the, it's understood that not all Kurds vote for Kurdish parties, but it, the guest, the guesstimate is 10 to 15% of the population are Kurds. Now, the, the, it's difficult in Turkey to talk about the Kurdish issue. A lot of Turks don't even say there is a Kurdish issue. We saw that with Ataturk saying that now on Turks. Uh, but part of that reason is because there is a great deal of assimilation. It's only in the villages in the mountains where the Kurds don't interact with Turks and all Kurdish men had to go to the army. So when you find it, like I have traveling in those mountain villages, you, the women usually do not speak a word of Turkish, but the men all speak fluent Turkish because they learned it in the army. But when you come down out of the mountains, uh, in the towns that are on the, on the plains where there's mixed population, almost every Kurd speaks Turkish. Uh, they go to school, so they learn it in school. Um, and second, they intermarry. And so there, it is a blurred line. And as I get to the end of the lecture, when the rise of a Kurdish nationalist party, interestingly, a lot of the people who are involved in that party don't speak Kurdish. They identify uh, ethnically as Kurds, but they, the, their writing and their propaganda is in Turkish because they, they really can't speak Tur uh, Kurdish. All right, so these people then move into the Genji Kunduz and you then have the Genji Kunduz are politicized. Some of them are right wing and the right wing party that emerges is called the um, National Movement Party in uh, Turkish. It's called the Milli Hareket Partisi or it's usually known by its its letters in Turkish, Mehepe, I'm sorry, Mehape, Mehape, and that's on your list. So Mehape are just an easy way to tag them is their right wing fascist nationalist. And they, they tend to be uh, organized by a Sunni, Turkish speaking Sunnis who come in to settle the Geji Kunduz. And the Geji Kunduz are, are, are separated by, usually by ethnicity or religion and also by what region you come from. So people from neighboring villages will all move to the same Geji Kundu. So you have some Geji Kundu that become centers of right wing political, extreme right wing political activity. Um, the, typically, the, the, the fascists are against the, work, the unions, they're against the, any religious minorities, they're against um, the Kurds. Um, and so they are um, uh, mobilizing in the, in the Geji Kunduz. And then on the left, you also have mobilization in the Geji Kunduz. And in the Geji Kunduz, the Alevis and the Kurds both move toward the left. Um, and are, are recruited by the Communist Party is illegal in Turkey, but there are many sympathizers. Um, and among students, most of the students are, are at this point are communists, although by the 70s, you get a clear break in the students between the right wing students and the left wing students. But in the 60s, it's left wing. And so it is anti-American. The Vietnam War is going on. There is a very strong trade union movement in Turkey and that trade union, although it technically can't be Marxist, is Marxist. Its leadership is all Marxist. I know some of the people that were involved in it, and they were definitely Marxist. Um, they had a, a restaurant cafe that was a workers-run restaurant. I remember going there in the 70s, and you would hear Joan Baez and, um, and um, you know, all the protest music from the United States at the time, uh, Bob Dylan and all those kinds of songs. I mean, these people were fervently anti-American in a sense they were anti-US policy, but they were embracing American uh, resistance culture. Uh, they went, most of them went to uh, Robert College, now Boazici, so they were, you know, fluent in English. And it was a kind of, for me, kind of ironic to see this, this hotbed of anti-Americanism where the, the people dressed with blue jeans and, and listening to American uh, left, granted, leftist music, but American music. So it was a real contradiction. But it also, the more extreme groups were organizing and they were known as the revolutionary youth. Um, and that's on your list there. That's uh, Dev Remji, Gensler. Uh, um, 
Dev Remji, revolutionary, Gensh is youth, um, uh, and they were shortened to Dev Gensh. So Dev Remji Genschler, the revolutionary youth, uh, to Dev Gensh. And it has an extra meaning because Dev in Turkish, besides seeming to be the beginning of the word Dev Remji, Dev stands by itself. It means like a monster, a demon. You know, so powerful, the powerful youth, the, ter the terrible youth. And they were violent and they start to uh, assassinate uh, police. And they also uh, strongly, they, um, you know, set up bombs in various places. They, and the, the real uh, straw that broke the camel's back is in 19, uh, 1971, they kidnap uh, several American servicemen. American bases are in Turkey. There was, there still are two main ones. One is Izmir, which is a port um, for the NATO fleet in the Mediterranean. So the NATO fleet in the Mediterranean is largely made up of American ships. The other is a air base in southern Turkey, which you'll hear from time to time. Lately it's even been in the news, called Injilik, and that's on, be spelled on your thing. So that is now near Adana. That is a major. And then there were numerous um, American installations, and in fact, when we when the Cuban Missile Crisis was settled, how it was settled was that the Russians agreed to withdraw their missiles from Cuba, and we took our missiles out of Turkey. And at that time, Turks did not know there were American missiles pointed at Soviet Union from Turkey, and that that added to the kind of anti-American feeling that they had been not Americans had not been completely honest with them about what America was doing with Turkish soil. Uh, so there were maybe 20,000 in 1971, I'm sorry, 71, uh, there may be uh, uh, up to 20,000 American troops in Turkey. So their presence, they tried to be discreet. They never wore the uniforms uh, off base, um, but everybody knew they were there. And so a num I think it's, I don't remember the exact numbers, about a half a dozen are kidnapped by the Dev Gensh. And they also kidnapped the Israeli uh, consul in um, Istanbul because the left in Turkey is very anti-Israel as a, not as a Jewish state, but as a, an oppressor of the Palestinian peoples. So they, they buy into this whole revolutionary language of the, the left of the 1960s and 70s. Um, so the army then takes over. It says that it is a uh, the move to guided democracy that again see the idea that the the Turkish people if left alone are not yet uh, sophisticated enough politically to do the right thing which is to follow the principles of Mustafa Kemal either they're going to go to the right or they're going to go to the left and the army has to come in and set things right um, and they do this because the Americans are freed, but the Turkish, I'm sorry, the Israeli consul is actually killed. He's found in a trunk of a car uh, in Istanbul. Uh, so the army took over and it's again brief. It gives basically a slap on the hand to the political parties. And um, they um, are then free to go on. And I just remember the, the head of the the Justice Party, his name is Erbakan. So then the two main political figures of the 1970s, and I was traveling in and out of Turkey this time, visiting friends and doing some preliminary research. So I saw it up close, some of the, the trouble that was going on. The two political leaders were uh, Suleiman, I'm sorry, I said Erbakan, sorry about that. Suleiman Demirel, who was head of the Justice Party. So that, they're all beyond it. It's on the sheet and it's clear there. So I get confused here, just go back to the sheet. So Suleiman Demirel is head of the Justice Party and um, uh, the head of the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the old Republican People's Party is a man named Bulent Ejevit, who is a, a scholar. He translated uh, uh, Homer from Greek, classical Greek into Turkish, very erudite man. Um, and beloved by the American left and American university professors. Uh, and so he, the two parties are then campaigning and it, you get a spiral of violence after this because you have the Dev Gensh are still there. And then you have the, the um, remember I told you, the Mehepe, the, the National Movement Party. Uh, they have their own armed guys and they're called the Grey Wolves. 
Um, and so the gray wolves are fighting the Devgench. The Devgench are basically the, the, the communist, the leftist. And there's, there's violence going on all the time. Um, and uh, in fact, in Turkey, it was called the Tulu, the terror. And it would be in the newspapers, uh, you know, uh, how many people were shot today? Uh, leftists congregated in leftist places and rightists congregated in rightist coffee shops and those would be bombed. I had Turkish friends who told me that when I, I tend, like most Turkish intellectuals I know, I, t I read the newspaper, Jumhuriyet, which is the, the mouthpiece of the uh, Republican People's Party. And so they said, well, when you buy that newspaper, wrap it in a sport, buy a sports newspaper as well. And then put that, if you're holding it under your arm, uh, put that in, wrap it in the sports paint. And then when you're sitting at a cafe, put the sports paper out front and have the, the Jumhuriyet behind it. So people will think you're reading sports paper and not a political paper because they said some people are being shot because by rightists because they're reading leftist with newspapers. Right? And there were postcard shops, which were ecumenically would, shop, would sell rightist postcards and leftist postcards. And I had a collection of those ones, but I don't know where it went. Uh, but there was, there was a lot of low level violence. Um, so this goes on through the 70s. And then finally, and I had been in, uh, mentioned this when I talked about the army regimes, I'd been in Syria in 79 and 80. And then in, in August of 80, I left Syria and Syria was, was, was you know, simmering, the, the Muslim brothers were still blowing up things and assassinating people. This was before the Hama, uh, 1982, the Hama incident. Uh, and in Turkey, it was, there were guns everywhere. And uh, the army, you know, was checking people, but still the, there was a lot of violence. Um, uh, and I lived, I was doing research and I had friends who were Americans who were part of the Robert College, um, a mother and son. And the son had married, to come back to Turkey, gone to Harvard and come back to Turkey and got a job in Turkey and married to a Turkish professor. And she was, uh, she was a leftist, very often. Her, her sister was actually a member of the Communist Party. Um, and uh, I went, I was out to visit the, the mother and the, the her son, who was a good friend of mine from, I knew him from graduate school. Uh, and there also was a friend of theirs who was uh, American Turk, and that is she was born in Turkey of an American father and an Armenian mother. And she was married to a Turkish um, army officer. This was the evening of September the 10th, uh, 1980. And I, they invited me to dinner, the, the mother invited me to dinner. and. Uh, my friend was there and a couple of other Americans were there, a couple of British people were there, and then the wife of the Turkish naval officer. And he was not there. And at one point during the dinner, there's a phone call and the maid comes in and says to the guest, well, the, uh, the husband of the wife, uh, the woman that's part Turkish, part American, uh, he wants to talk to her. So she you know, goes out of the room, talks on the telephone, comes back and we continue our conversation and people starting to break up. Now I was living in a neighborhood that was uh, controlled by the right. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the wife of the Turkish Naval officer said to the hostess, maybe it'd be a good idea if Bruce stayed in your house tonight. And she said, sure, you know, he, you know he'd been drinking. Uh, it was late, there was curfew at uh, I think 10 o'clock. Uh, and so you could still get taxis after the curfew, but you would be stopped by the army and the fact that I had alcohol in my breath. Anyway, whatever. They thought that it'd be, uh, it's, it's made sense that I spent the night there. So I woke up the next morning and the neighborhood spread up the hill, side of the hill. So it's north up above the university itself. And then on the top of the hill was a Gejikondu that was um, leftists lived there. Alavis were living there. And... Uh, we heard all day long when the army came on the radio said the army has taken over the country everything is closed everybody must stay in their houses for three days and uh so i stayed in that house for three days and um we could hear gunshots all those three days gunshots and helicopters and and then eventually the army opens up and says okay it's it's over nobody was killed we arrested a hundred thousand people but nobody was killed and the government has still maintained that and it, there's no way that nobody was killed 
Uh, but the army did take over, and this time it was a much longer transition uh, to civilian rule. The uh, general in charge of the coup was a man named Kanan Evren. When the uh, government did return in 1983, so three years of direct military rule, uh, the um, president was then Kanan Evren. So the general who had been the uh, uh, head of the military was then elected the president of the, the Turkish Republic. Uh, the constant, there was a new constitution that was to be written, and there was a slow transition. Uh, all the parties that had been uh, in parliament before the coup were banned. So the Republican People's Party was banned, the Justice Party, the right wing party, the Mili Hareket Party, the MHP. And there also had been a, a religious party called uh, MSP, um, Mili Salamet Party, or the National Salvation Party, and that was led by. I said Erbakan earlier, this was led by Nejmetin Erbakan. Okay, so we have a new party that's created by the government. It's the only party that's allowed. It's called the uh, Constitution Party, the Anavatan Party, and it's head by a guy named Turgut Uzal, who's also on your list. Now, in 96, they start to let more parties in, and gradually uh, military rule is listed, lifted. It's lifted in the the western part of the country, it stays in effect in the Kurdish part, the southeastern part of the country, and it's not really lifted there until 2001, and I then got a trip into that region in 2001 because it was the first time they had allowed foreigners into that region. So the Kurdish region of, of Turkey was basically cut off from, from outsiders. I mean, people from the region could go in and out. But foreigners couldn't go into there. Reporters, especially, couldn't go into the, the Turkish region. And I'll talk just a minute why. So the new constitution uh, basically uh, maintains this body of the the uh, consultative group of the army generals and the and the cabinet. But it also then limits the parties. The government had felt the army felt that there had been too many parties, and that had led to to uh, um, anarchy in the parliament. So they wanted to limit the number of parties. So initially there were only two parties that were allowed, uh, like the old days of the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, but they then said that in order to sit in parliament, you had to get 10% of the vote nationally. So you could have a party that say won a province. There are, I forget how many par there are a lot of provinces in Turkey, 40, I think, 40 something provinces in Turkey. You could win a province, 100% of the vote in the province, but if you didn't get 10% of the vote nationally, you could not, that person, the votes would be wasted. You would be, there would be no one there. The second person who got the second most votes uh, would win. So you could conceivably win that seat with only 8% of the vote. But that was the thing. You had to get a 10% ceiling. They thought that would limit it, as we'll, I'll give a lecture on more modern Turkey. It hasn't. It has tended to limit the parties um, that are in parliament, but there are numerous parties that are still running. Uh, and it didn't create the stability that it wanted because what happened is the old parties returned. And so you have the, uh, the Republican People's Party is allowed to come back under its own name. And the Justice Party then uh, reappears as the um, National Salvation Party, and that is led by uh, Erbakan. So the guy who had been in the more religious party, uh, more religious, the, in other words, the, the, the old uh, party, MSP, MSP, it was a religious party on the right as opposed to the fascist party, nationalist party on the right. But he then emerges uh, because uh, uh, Demerel can't, anyone who was in the political system before the who couldn't head the party, you had to have someone else. And so the, what had been the Justice Party morphs into the National Salvation Party, and that's head by uh, Erbakan, who had been the head of the more religious. So what you get in the, in the opposition to the, the Republican People's Party is that not only is the party in opposition uh, pro-capitalist, it's also increasingly um, Islamic, wanting uh, Islamic institutions. 
uh, something that the the Democrat Party didn't. The Democrat Party wanted religious uh, holidays back, and as I said, the schools started to teach religion. Uh, public holidays, the two of the national holidays in Turkey now are the, the Muslim fe feast at the end of Ramadan and then the Feast of the Sacrifice that comes during the month of the pilgrimage. So those two became official holidays. They had not been celebrated under the, the true Republican period, the Ataturk period. Uh, but in the 50s, they're celebrated. And now they're national holidays in Turkey. Uh, so that there's a drift toward it. But the, the, what had been more of, I would say, a conservative um, uh, pro-capitalist party becomes increasingly a pro-religious party. And so this way, it, it kind of mirrors the shift in the Republican Party in the United States at the same time. In the United States Republican Party had been strong on foreign, you know, strong military, uh, pro-capitalist, but not particularly religious. Uh, and then starting with Reagan and even more so later, it becomes more and more uh, religious. So the Republican Party has stresses religious values. The, the what had been the Democrat Party now becomes parties that are the same in Turkey. And in fact, their, par their party newspapers often will have long articles by Jerry Falwell or various other fundamentalist Christian writers in the United States translated into Turkish. So there is a, a mirroring of what's going on in Turkey to what went on in the United States. Uh, but more importantly for Turkey and the period of Uzal is that uh, the army is very afraid of the leftist, much more afraid of the leftist than it is of the rightist. So the union, the strong union that I had mentioned is banned. And also then the, um, the, the government industries are privatized. And so it's something similar, it's going on in the Soviet Union at this time. There's a privatization of the old communist industries in the 90s. Also in the 90s in Turkey, Turkey joins the IMF for the first time. And uh, when they join the IMF, they then have to say that they're not going to have in, import substitution anymore. And so Turkey is totally open to foreign trade. But the, the cocoon period that Turkey had uh, experienced uh, when it wasn't free trading meant that Turkey had a ground industry. And so when things were privatized, the people who had the capital largely were people who had been in agricultural business. So the, some of the big family names, one of the largest one is Koch. The Koch family in, in southeastern Turkey had made their money on first cotton and then textiles. They opened up textile factories. They were in a position to take over some of the large, and they're, I think they're the, one of the largest holding companies in Turkey today. But uh, it, it just turned overnight. Um, Turkey turned from being this kind of very closed place economically to very open. So, you know, all the Western uh, department stores open up branches, uh, shopping centers, uh, malls, not shopping centers, but malls open up across Turkey. And Turkey really starts to look like a, a Western European country, at least in the Western parts of the country. And that was all accomplished by um, Uzal. And so a lot of Turks, even the ones who were more leftist, uh, looked at that period as a kind of a, a, not a bad time for Turkey. Turkey's GNP grows dramatically. The standard of living goes up a bit as well. Um, the leftists are completely silenced. Uh, and uh, uh, But he, oh, the other thing they do is they open up to, Turkey decides, Turkey had had a very neutral attitude toward the world. It decided it, it didn't want to have much to do with the outside world other than joining NATO. Uh, but with the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Turkey sees itself as being in a position to uh, come to the aid of the Turkish republics of the former Soviet Union. So those are Azerbaijan, uh, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. Those, those republics are all inhabited by people who speak a Turkic language. And so um, what Uzal did is turn to them and offer Turkish uh, technical advice. Uh, they opened a special university in Konya to educate people from those republics free at Turkish government expense. Uh, and then Turkish businesses went in and the Turkish businesses then really make a profit off of this. And this is something they will do later in the Balkans as well in the 2000s, uh, is that they have the expertise for a third world country to modernize 
And so they're actually at a middle level that uh, countries that are uh, below them in the terms of development see Turkish expertise as, as more useful than American or uh, uh, Western European. So the Turks are in a very good place uh, in the 90s to, to, to advance their production. So you start to see, I'm going into Syria at this time, you, you see in the grocery stores, Turkish products, almost all the all of the processed food is from Turkey. You see, go into the, um, uh, the appliance store, you'll see the washing machines, the television sets, and the television sets now increasing more Chinese or, or Korean or Japanese, but the washing machines, the refrigerators, those kinds of things are Turkish made. Uh, Turkish cars start to appear on the streets of Arab cities. So Turkey really goes through a boom uh, after this, this transition uh, that the army uh, had, had had initiated uh, with its coup in 1980. It doesn't really boom into the 90s. That's when you get a full transition back to democracy. Um, uh, and you get a drift in of the, you get again the competition between the right wing party, right wing party usually, there's only one now, and then the, the old uh, Republican People's Party. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about is also in this period, in the 1980s, because of the military control in uh, the country, and especially in the Southeast, because the Kurds, as I mentioned earlier, had been associated by the army with the left, and they were. I mean, it wasn't just a false analogy. Uh, Kurds were very much active in the leftist movements, as were the Alevis. Uh, but the, the, the Kurdish region was heavily under military control. And so you get the formation of a radical Turkey, I'm sorry, Kurdish group, which wants independence from Turkey. And this group calls itself, um, I'm trying to remember now why we get the, the it's called the, the PKK. Uh, so Parte Kardalan Kurdistane. So that's on your, your list. And that in Turkish means the, the, Kurdish, the Kurdish Workers Party. But in, in all Western literature, it's always just called the PKK. So its leader is a man named um, uh, Öcalan, and he's on your list as well. Uh, he is a college student in Turkey. He, as I mentioned previously, he doesn't speak Kurdish. He's a Turkey, Turkophone. Uh, but he then starts a military actions against the Turkish government, um, uh, assassinating anyone working for the government, so police, school teachers, uh, and other government employees. And uh, the, the Turkish government then uses that as excuse why, remember I said martial law isn't raised in the South until 2001. That's also the year they catch him. Ojalan had gone to, fled out of Turkey and went to uh, Syria. Uh, the Turkish government basically threatened to invade Syria in 2001 unless they kicked him out. He was kicked out and then was captured. I think he went to Greece and then he was captured by Turkish commandos and he's currently imprisoned. He has a death sentence, but he's, he's still there. So 19 years later, he's still alive. Um, and uh, his first name is Abdullah. So people call, often call themselves Apuju. Apu is the nickname for Abdullah. So Apuju would be what uh, a person who follows Abdullah um, Ujilan. Uh, and so Apujus. The Apujus then are the PKK guys. And they are, they seek the military overthrow, uh, or not overthrow all Turkey, of the separation of of Kurdistan from Turkey, and then the establishment of a socialist communist uh, Kurdistan in um, Iraq, uh, Turkey, and Syria. And the guys that we had been helping in Syria, they are the Syrian equivalent of those people. So the, the Kurdish that the Americans were supporting were actually communist. Um, you know, they don't know that they didn't make any, you know, they try to hide it. When you see there, if you saw see any of their funerals on YouTube, you'll see that they have banners and Marx and, and Stalin and whatever. They're Stalinist. Uh, so that's the PKK is Stalinist as well. It's, a, it's an extreme uh, communist movement. And so what that did is it, it, it led to the government starting to be very coercive in the South. It began to um, 
move people out of villages and move them into protective hamlets. This was something the United States had done and didn't work in Vietnam. We moved peasants out of areas where we thought they would be influenced by the Viet Cong into areas that could be more closely moder uh, moderated by the military. Uh, and it didn't work in Vietnam. It didn't work in Turkey either. That This made a lot of people really angry. And so people were kicked out of their villages and forced to relocate in these places, or more of them then would go to cities. And uh, especially the city in the southeast of Turkey, that's on, on, spell it for you on the list, is Diyarbakir. It becomes a major center of P PKK, PKK, if you want to pronounce it the Turkish way, uh, PKK activity in Turkey. Um, I'll go, we'll talk more about that after we, in the lecture on, on um, United States involvement in Iraq, because it all then comes tied back together. So to close this, oh, I forgot the last intervention. So in the 90s, uh, when uh, the parties are pretty much running, functioning, the, uh, the Reform Party that's called the, the Reform Party, which is the party of the right, which is the party then of uh, Nejmetin Erbakan, it comes to power in 1996. And uh, its uh, mayor of, uh, of Istanbul, who's also in this party, is Erdogan, who now is the president of Turkey. So he gets his, his fame to claim in uh, uh, be coming to power as mayor of Istanbul uh, during this election when the, the, the right-wing party uh, gets, wins the parliament. And they then start to push through a lot more religious uh, things, uh, rallies against Israel, for example, various, you know, much more pushing for uh, religion, public use of religion in Turkish society, uh, the ending of the, va the ban. Uh, Turkey had had a ban on um, government employees. Uh, women could not wear the headscarf. If you were at university, you could not wear the headscarf. Uh, you had to be secular, show your hair. And so there was a lot of pushback from traditionalist elements uh, that wanted the women to be able to wear the headscarf both in government offices and at universities. Uh, so they were pushing that they were going to allow that, they said. And uh, so in 1997, the army basically, remember we have this joint council of the army generals and we have the, um, the civilian people, they meet periodically. And uh, they, um, they're not secret, they're broadcast, um, they're not broadcast live, but their summaries are shown on TV about it. <coughs> Uh, sorry, I didn't do the right thing, but I'm just here by myself. Uh, uh, the uh, army calls in uh, Erbakan and says, uh, we're going to have a coup unless you resign. So he resigned. So we then have, if we look back on Turkish history, we have uh, three interventions, I'm sorry, four interventions by the army, and we'll see that it'll be a, a fifth one is, is a, not a complete one is under Erb um, Erdogan, and that'll be in the other lecture. That happened what, three years ago. Um, the army then, so 1960, 1960 is they overthrow Menderes because they say he's corrupt. Uh, they hang him. And 1971, there's just a brief corrective moment when they say that the leftist guerrillas, leftist students, have become too violent, and they then put a martial law in place for a few months. And then there's the big intervention in 1980 when they take over the government and they stay in the government for three years. There is a gradual um, return bit by bit to civilian rule. Um, the parties though are, are more limited. In the 90s, the parties are given greater freedom to, to be the, what they wanna be. Uh, press is free during, from about 85 on, the press is very free in Turkey. Uh, it's not so much now under, under Erdogan, but from 85 on until the last couple of years, both the newspapers and television uh, are free. That's one of the things that Özel did is that he allowed, to, before there had only been Turkish national TV, which was run by the government uh, under Özel's uh, um, prime ministership. Uh, free uh, multiple uh, television stations emerge. Uh, CNN Turk is available. Uh, so CNN in Turkish is there. Uh, uh, so there's a, a lot of freedom 
in, and even, even Kurdish stuff is, is allowed. Um, not yet in Kurdish, but so if it's not, as long as it doesn't claim and call for the overthrow of the Turkish state and the creation of an independent Kurdistan, if it's just on Kurdish pride, cultural pride, then that's allowed as well. Uh, the Sufis, uh, the mystics who had been banned by Ataturk uh, in 1925 in reaction to the Site Said rebellion, remember he had said that it was a religious rebellion, not a Kurdish rebellion. And so he banned all the Sufi orders because Sheikh Said was a member of a Sufi group. Uh, all the Sufis were banned. Um, they were allowed back in public performance. Public, they were allowed to reclaim some of the houses that they have separate houses where they do their performances from mosque. Those were reopened under Uzal. Uh, and in fact, there's been a, a, an increased interest, especially in the Mevlevi, the Rumi, the whirling dervishes, especially among interesting among intellectuals. There is a real resurgence and in interest in that kind of Islam. Uh, not the Sunni Islam, but the more the mystical Islam. Uh, and so that, that then is the, the major intervention. Uh, Turkey then is returning to full democracy in the 90s. It's also booming economically. Um, that then leads to the, the election of the uh, winning of the, the more conservative elements and then the threat in 1997 of an army coup leads to the resignation of the prime minister. So there are four interventions, um, two vi very violent ones, uh, 1960 and 1980. All right, so I'll close there. I'll talk more about modern Turkey in another lecture. Like I said, the, the names are kind of confusing. So just keep this in mind that in Turkey, and it's easier I think for Americans to kind of imagine this, there is a, there is a right and there's a left. And the left in Turkey is somewhat similar to the American left, except that it's very nationalist. That is, it is the, the left has never embraced Kurdish rights. It's embraced workers' rights, it's embraced people's rights, it's embraced women's rights. But it doesn't, uh, is one of the stricter about uh, Kurdish language rights. Um, and it's kind of interesting, it, it never has embraced that. So in that sense, they're not leftists, they're nationalists uh, in their political and their worldview, they're nationalist, but in their um, in uh, terms of economic view, they're leftist and they're also secularists. So that way they're more like the Democrats in the United States. Opposed to them are is the right and the right is um, largely rural or from small towns, um, provincial towns, very conservative. They're the people whose wives will still be wearing the headscarves. Uh, although interesting, they will allow their daughters often to go to university and get educated, uh, as long as they're still wearing the headscarf. So they're not, you know, extreme conservative like you'd find in Saudi Arabia or some of the Arab countries, but they're, they are, they do want religion, a place for religion in Turkish society. So this way they're, they're like the American Republican Party as well. Now in, in Turkey, uh, America, we're, we're, Pretty much evenly divided, we say, but generally the, the polling shows that there's more uh, Democrats, uh, people leaning, than there are Republican. And Turkey is the other way around, uh, consistently, although the margin is very close. So consistently in Turkey, you get about 55% of the people um, support the religious um, parties, the parties that were. Um, thought that religion should have a place in Turkish society and also pro-capitalist. And about 35% uh, uh, support the old Republican People's Party and about 10% support the various Kurdish parties. So the left then in Turkey is about 45% because the Kurdish parties, although they, they want Kurdish national rights, in terms of economic issues, they're, they're leftist. They want uh, social, social justice uh, because Kurdish areas are, are very much impoverished. So I'll leave it there. Um, like I said, you don't need to keep most of the names in place, but I will be very careful in my setting up the, the, the study sheet to have it all. I haven't actually done that yet. I've decided to record the lecture first and then just because I've been doing it the other way around and I realized I missed things. So this one won't have questions on it, but it will have a, a, a study sheet of the various parties and then the dates that are important. So um, I hope you're still doing well and that uh, you're not getting uh, cabin fever like we get in the wintertime here in New England where we can't go out because of the snow. I hope you're out 
walking around, getting some exercise, but also I hope you're keeping your social distance. So I'll stop this lecture now, say goodbye for now, and wish you all well.